Hello and welcome to another podcast from Agile Technology. Today we're very fortunate we're being joined by Marcel Gouri um, from Cited, the one of the co-founders and the CEO of Cited. Hello, Marcel. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. And I'm very pleased that we've got you today. You've had immense success in the few years that you've you've started Cited. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling the audience about your background, how you ended up where you are today, and the beginning of Cited, please. Yeah, of course. So yeah, my professional background started, um, I would almost say somewhere in my teenage years. I always had a very strong passion for computer science um, because of some some personal health related issues in my teenage years, but really interested in healthcare. Um, but then after finishing school in Germany, the, the first leap I made wasn't directly into medicine. It actually was into natural sciences. So I um, went into a, a very physics heavy degree, which was focusing on material sciences. And after a few years transitioned over into, into medical imaging. Um, interestingly, because I had that computer science background, um, during that transition to medical imaging, I realized that a lot of the skills which, which, I've, which I've acquired on the, on the computer science front were pretty applicable on some of the areas we've been looking at at the time. And this was really in 2014, 2015, 2016, when machine learning and deep learning was really on the rise and really you know, was um, starting to penetrate various different areas in academia. So I very quickly adapted to that and picked up a number of interests around machine learning applications on healthcare data, but more particularly on medical imaging. And after a few years, or after a couple of years of doing that in a master's degree, um, came to the UK and um, started doing a PhD in Cambridge, working on machine learning applications, again, on medical imaging data, but very much focused on early cancer detection. So um, we worked on several different projects relating to anatomical imaging, but also more importantly, on the molecular and on the pathological side, trying to understand how we can interrogate data to find patients earlier than what they would usually be found at. And if they're being found earlier, making sure that there are interventions available for these patients. Specifically, I've been working on upper GI cancers and GI cancers for, uh, for the last many years now, not in an academic capacity, um, but now in the context of Cited as a company, which I will tell you more about in a second. But when I started working um, with, with some, some of the two founding members actually of Cited here in Cambridge during my PhD, I'm, I, we very quickly realized there was a big unmet need, particularly when it comes to upper GI cancers, where we simply don't have enough um, preventative early detection tools available. If you, Stephen, have heartburn or reflux symptoms, the only way how you usually can be diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor for esophageal cancer or cancer itself, you would have to go for an endoscopy. I think a lot of people know that endoscopy is, is usually a resource that's always maxed out and waiting this, particularly in the UK, go from months into the years. And we have been really thinking about are there any minimally invasive technologies that can be, can be used in an outpatient setting or in an office-based setting that really reduces the demand on endoscopy, um, but also critically helps finding patients that might not usually present for an endoscopy. So Cited is a company, you know, very much a continuation of my background, which is somewhere blended between physics and biomedical engineering and computer science, um, working all around minimally invasive um, approaches to detect upper GI cancers, now also working on inflammatory diseases, but this is sort of how my background led into the creation of Cited. Marcel, I wonder if you could tell people what Cited is, what the product is and how it works. Yes. So as I mentioned, we work on minimally invasive approaches. Our core product and, and key focus area is a capsule sponge technology, which uses a small pill on a string that can be ingested by a patient with, with a glass of water. Um, the pill travels into the stomach. After a few minutes, a capsule around the pill around the material inside the pill dissolves. There's a small piece of sponge that expands, which is then withdrawn um, after a few minutes, and it really collects cells from the top of the stomach and the entire length of the esophagus. We then ship those cells to, to our central lab, and then we test them for various different diseases with a very key focus on Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. It's a lot more comfortable for a patient. It can be done in an outpatient setting. The procedure is done in less than 10 minutes. Um, doesn't require any sedation, comes with significantly lower risks. We have been demonstrating the efficacy of this in, in three very large clinical trials. Um, most recently, one published in The Lancet, which was a 13,000 patient randomized control trial. 
it's now deeply integrated into the NHS already. Um, we're live in around 80, 80 sites across the UK, um, which, is a, which is an excellent footprint. And patients that are referred with reflux or heartburn symptoms from their GP these days, there's a decent chance, depending on which patch of the country they're living in, that they actually receive our test first before they would move on to get an endoscopy. So it's all about finding those patients earlier and enabling them to access something that's has much lower access barriers than an endoscopy, but also the people that would be considered for an endoscopy, way too many of them get one and they have no clinical significant finding. We can reduce that by up to 80%, which is some really, really cool data, which is going to come out in the next few months. But this is sort of the first key area we have been working on over the last few years and really developing the footprint of it over the last few years. I think the NHS have recognized the health impact that you're having. I, re I only realized a few months ago that you were awarded the SBRI award for, I think, 3.4 million. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So that is all about getting, um, yeah, this, this is really the continuation of some of the work we have been doing with the NHS at the national level on working out of a, I would almost say COVID response phase where we were really using our technology to address bottlenecks and shortages in secondary care. Um, so really in hospitals, which are faced with massive backlogs and waiting lists on the endoscopy, upper GI endoscopy front. And um, we're now using that, um, that work and are translating that into community and primary care, where, which is where we really see the technology thrive in, in the long term. And that is what, what NHS England with SBRI is supporting right now. And as a matter of fact, it has actually started only two weeks ago. So the first community and primary care clinics have been delivered just a matter of days ago, essentially. And that's the heartburn health check system, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, that's the heartburn health check. This is really for patients, you know, that have long-term heartburn reflux or chronic reflux symptoms. Um, they very often are at significant risk. And in that population, we see very high prevalences of, of esophageal precancer. But often we would not consider them for an endoscopy just simply because our systems are not made for capturing those patients with an endoscopy. We have no other intervention for these patients except giving them medication and hoping that their heartburn is manageable. Um, so what we now do in our heartburn health check is proactively offering these patients an intervention or a test which can help them to almost get screened in a targeted way. So it's not yet a screening program. We're, we're working on some really interesting stuff there and there's a large trial starting in the UK in 140,000 patients early next year, which is a screening trial. So it's proper screening program. Currently we use it as a targeted screening um, tool in, in patients where you know a GP might consider them for an endoscopy, but they don't feel like they're convinced enough or their symptoms are not pronounced strongly enough. In terms of digital diagnostics, how do you fit into that pathway that's that, that in, in some regions of the UK there are there's quite advanced digital diagnostics in other areas, there's not. How does it work in the primary care setting to the tertiary setting? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We had we have lots of interesting case studies on you know, where this worked really well and then where we where we ran into some, some deeply intrinsic systems issues around the disconnect between primary, secondary, and tertiary care and how patients are being referred. Does everyone in that referral pathway even know about our technology, which is a fundamental question? You know, you're being, you're being referred for what looks like an endoscopy. Um, your GP then hears back that you actually had a completely different test and they sort of wondered, oh, what, what, what happened there? What, what did they do in that hospital? So we have been doing quite a bit of work on understanding what types of digital tools can we develop and, and can we use to, to help some of that patient flow, how that patient flow is captured, how information is disseminated between primary, secondary, and tertiary care. Uh, but it's really a it's really a work in progress that you know is informed by some of our more anecdotal evidence or anecdotal experiences on how to maneuver, let's say, multi-stakeholder organizations or, or discussions like the integrated care systems, which we now have, have all over the UK. And you're working very well with a handful of um, integrated care systems, I understand. Yes, yes. We are very focused on, on work with cancer alliances right now, which sort of, as you know, spread, spread across several um, ICSs sometimes. Um, but yes, the, the footprint we now have, um, particularly with our Cytoprime 2 project, which is the big primary community um, care uh, project, we have engagement with lots of, uh, I think with almost all cancer alliances in the UK, but a lot of ICSs too. Um, and, and still trying to understand how, 
you know, having demonstrated value in multiple ICSs then still applies to a new ICS that is interested in the technology and how, how that value proposition from a cost effectiveness perspective, but also from a pathway transformation perspective really, really transitions from, from A to B. How does AI fit into your business model? Uh, ex excellent question. So um, a lot of the things which people see um, of, of what we do doesn't really look like, it doesn't look very techy, let's put it like that. You know, we have our minimally invasive cell collection that goes into, into, into our lab. And then afterwards, we, we make that as simple as possible for clinicians and others to interact with. They get a report back, which gives them all of the actual information they need. Um, but I think the key question is how is that information generated and also what work are we doing to work towards the next generation of biomarkers, which we are, um, which we're launching later this year, next year, which are really going to transform how we will be able to, to diagnose some patients with much better performance characteristics, but also maybe giving some hint at um, how likely, for example, for a Barrett's patient is that they might progress to cancer or not. So the AI piece is really on, on the backend side around how we integrate omics data, how do we discover new biomarkers, how do we use um, pathology images paired together with, with sequencing data and methylation data to discover better biomarkers than what we currently use, which are really, you know, they're really a legacy of, of what we have been working with for, for a long time, but they are not the ones which, uh, you know, will get us to a scale of being able to test hundreds of thousands or potentially even millions of patients, you know, in, in the Western world. So AI, we basically use for biomarker, biomarker discovery, computer vision to combine some of the various types of information we have. And yeah, to really drive, as I mentioned, the development of our next biomarker platform. That's, that's all happening in the background, but that's where the AI component sits in the company. But trying to develop a fully automated system is something that you're working towards. That is correct. Yeah, that is fully correct. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, also, in the interest of you know turnaround times and um, the ability to scale into other jurisdictions, we're doing a lot of US market access right now. Um, and you know, there's so many considerations there around how will you get paid from a coverage and reimbursement perspective, but also just practical questions on you know our current essay does work really well but if you want to run this in multiple labs across the world in multiple jurisdictions then you know we have to think what other things we need to address to get to proper scale eventually so abroad, apart from triaging barrett's esophagitis what other what other hallmark indicators are you looking for yeah so so it's 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 actually a pretty cool question because the the devil's really in the detail here because you know you would think you would think Oh, cool! It's a it's a pill on a string. I swallow it, and when it's being brought up, you know, it tells me whether I have Barrett's or cancer. We actually are pursuing three use cases. Um, the first one is really targeted screening. We call it proactive case finding patients, which wouldn't be considered for an endoscopy. You know, hundreds of thousands of patients and millions in in many countries out there that have uh, heart burn, chronic heartburn or reflux symptoms that will never get an endoscopy. That's the first one. So in those patients, we find pre-cancer or cancer where it would otherwise be missed because those patients would usually go on, they live their life, they might never get an endoscopy, they present with, uh, with late stage disease and that with esophageal cancer, as, as both you and I know, comes with very, very, very poor outcome statistics, one of the highest mortality cancers. Um, we then also do triaging of endoscopy referrals, which is where really the cost saving and the cost effectiveness piece comes in. So if you are a low risk patient, which is considered for an endoscopy, you could get our test first, and if our test is negative, you, you will not need an endoscopy. If you're positive, we can tell you whether you need an urgent endoscopy or routine endoscopy. The last one is very experimental, and that's basically monitoring patients with existing Barrett's esophagus. Don't have to focus too much on that. It's really sort of in its, inf in its infancies right now, and we're still building the real-world evidence on that. But on the cancer front, it's really spread across these three use cases, which is which is great because different health systems have different interests in where they want to use these technologies. They can, they have flexibility on where to use it in the pathway, and we have very good data to back up every single one of these use cases. We are now looking at some very exciting um, areas around inflammatory diseases where there have been lots of drug approvals in the last few years, particularly for esophagitis, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. So there's some really cool work in the pipeline on that front. Um, but yeah, that is that is uh, in 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 the late R and D steps right now, and I think we're going to make more noise later this year and next year on that front. 
And of course, in 2020, you incorporated uh, Pathonomics. Uh, we actually acquired the company. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. So it was um, it was a it was an it was an interesting point for us in time because we cited as a company, you know, started in 2018, but nothing happened because I started my PhD in 2018. So the company existed on paper, but we we had money in the bank and we started hiring the first people in, in early 2020. And, and then we were facing some interesting, challenging commercial and operational questions very early on, because when COVID started and we were fast tracked into various different sites across the UK, uh, one of the questions for us is how do we address our laboratory infrastructure? And then we initially partnered and then um, ended up acquiring a company called Pathonomics, which uh, ended up becoming our, our key laboratory infrastructure in the UK. Are you working with Cancer Research UK? Uh, yes, we are working with Cancer Research UK. Cancer Research UK is actually a small, um, small, small shareholder in the company, um, you know, having been pivotal in enabling us to get access to some of the, the data um, and licensing some data in the early days. Uh, we are always trying to engage and engaging with them on, on the policy front. I think there's still lots of work to be done around um, early detection awareness. There's, there's many other players in the space um, like Grail um, that are making making noise and, and a lot of progress to push the boundaries of that space and, and make people aware that these tests exist and that the pull of the patient or the push of the patient makes a big difference. So yeah, there's work going on and we're working on a very exciting sector alliance with various different uh, charities and, and nonprofit organizations across the UK with the eye for an, aware, or with an eye on an awareness campaign next year. Um, so, so yeah, we're trying to keep all of those, all of those uh, organizations on board where we can. Excellent. If an integrated care system or a particular region in France or Spain or Norway approached you, would you help map out the patient pathway with them? Absolutely. I mean, we have, an, we have actually a dedicated team that has been working on everything around pathway integration upstream, downstream of where our tests can create the most impact, where it can create the most savings, where it can create the best public health impact. Um, and it is really important because one might think just because we've started commercializing this in the UK so far, um, we might not have a sensitivity around differences in pathways. I mean, even in the UK, we have significant differences by region in pathways. And if we extrapolate that to Europe, where we have done a lot of work and engagement over the last year on, on the guideline side, particularly, which there will be some very, very cool news coming out very soon on that front. Um, we are all about understanding before we would even start running the first clinic, understand where does this patient come from and where will the patient go after they have a positive or a negative result? What does the clinical safety netting look like? What is the eligibility for the patients that should get the test to begin with? And then also if symptoms change after they receive the test, how do we capture them and how do they get the right care at the right time? So um, as I mentioned, we, we are now have exercised this in, in a lot of depth also in other countries. We have been working um, um, in, in one of the Nordic countries in Sweden on this for a while now. Um, there's some work we're doing in the Netherlands, uh, also in the US. We have been very sort of like deeply exploring the pathway and understanding where we best fit in. But absolutely, yes. I mean, we usually start um, before we would even go to any, you know, call it a business case or a proper value proposition for why people should do this or not do this. We would try to understand why does this work for you and what are your key priorities that you want to address? Do you want to reduce your late stage cancer diagnosis rate? Do you want to increase early stage cancer diagnosis rate? Or do you want to save costs on endoscopies? That, that is yes. all important and feeds right into the pathway design. It is difficult uh, because I know that in some trusts, I'm oh, sorry, some, some healthcare systems, a lot of money is made out of doing scopes. That is correct. Yes, um, that is correct. The, the, I think the question is, um, you know, if we think about the value-based care versus fee-for-service model in that context, value-based care will all be around reducing costs. Um, fee-for-service will be more interested in, can we find more people? And, and I know this is always something that is, you know, slightly controversial to say, but I think everyone unanimously agrees on that, is what the motivational drivers behind that are. Uh, I think if the resources are available and they can be spent on that, we can, if we dedicate more money on early demo in those systems, if we dedicate more resources to 
um, finding patients earlier and finding more patients so we get better overall population outcomes or health outcomes that can be done if it's only about reducing costs which other people have in mind then that's also totally possible as i mentioned our our use case is really enabled to find more patients but also triage patients if yeah. necessary um, we are pretty mindful and we are big ambassadors of the value-based care model i think that's important to say um, but we're starting a screening study here in the uk later this year so that being said, you know, we're all about health economics and not necessarily about fee for service. You know, we know that if you offer this as a new intervention, sure, you might create a bit more, a few more endoscopies, but we have also shown in some um, health economic analyses that we fundamentally change outcomes. Thank you very much for your time and efforts today. And I wish you the greatest of success in the future. I love the technology. And I think that you've gone from first in patient to where you are today within two years. And you yes. and you finished a PhD. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Thank you, Stephen. Impressive. All right, a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.